lecture will be on Hensel's lemma and ramification theory. So let me begin with um, a statement that QP is not algebraically closed. Uh, recall that in the real number field case, uh, the real numbers are not algebraically closed because the polynomial equation x squared plus one equals zero has no solution in the real number field. And then we all know that if you adjoin square root of minus one to the real numbers, you get the complex numbers. And the fundamental theorem of algebra tells you that uh, the complex numbers are algebraically closed. Every polynomial uh, has up degree n has n roots. <clears throat> Uh, so that's the situation there. And then the field that you uh, obtain by joining square root minus one is a finite extension of the reals. It has degree two. Uh, but unlike this situation, QP is, is not algebraically closed. Uh, and unlike the reals, it's, it's algebraic closure is actually of infinite degree over QP. And when taking its, uh, when, when, when we take its completion, we get what is called CP, which is both complete and algebraically closed. So this is the analog of the complex numbers. The study of CP, uh, the complex, p-adic complex numbers, as they're called, falls under the title of rigid analytic spaces and will not be discussed uh, in this in these lectures. But if you were to look in math reviews under the title of rigid analytic spaces, this is basically what they're talking about. So we'll confine most of the time to our attention to uh, QP and finite extensions of QP, uh, but we will not really do uh, heavy duty analysis in CP. So we'll be given with an important theorem called Hensel's Lemma. So what is Hensel's Lemma? It says basically, if you have a solution of a polynomial mod P, you can lift that solution to the p-adic numbers. That's what it says. So supposing I have a polynomial with ZP coefficients, and let's say the formal derivative of a polynomial is just basically what you would get by differentiating uh, the polynomial. So for example, x to the n would have derivative n times x to the n minus one, and so on and so forth. So you can just take a formal derivative. If the formal derivative um, evaluated at a1 um, is not zero and a1 is a solution of f of x equals zero mod p, then the solution actually lifts to a p-adic solution. <clears throat> and so that's the proof, that's what that's that's the theorem. And we'll prove it. It's very simple proof. Again, most of these proofs are elementary number theory uh, and uh, induction. So we're going to prove that if f of x equals zero mod p to the n has a solution, I can lift it to mod p to the n plus one. And then if you keep on lifting it to higher and higher powers of p, eventually that limit will go, uh, will converge to a point in the p-adic numbers. So if f of x equals zero has a solution a n, we want to now find another number a n plus one modulo p n plus one, such that you have f of a n plus one is zero mod p n uh, p n plus one. And then you want to make sure that a n plus one is the same as a n mod p to the n. So in order to do that, uh, you will write a n plus one as p to the n times t plus a n. And then what you want to do is now construct a new number such that f of p to the n t plus a n is zero mod p to the n. <clears throat> and if we write our polynomial f of x as summation c i x to the i, we get that f of p to p to the n t plus a sub n, you just plug in a sub n plus p to the n t into for x and uh, use the binomial theorem. And you can see that the higher powers of p don't matter. And only these first two terms uh, matter. And then you can now see the appearance of the derivative, the formal derivative showing up. So f of a, that turns out to be f of a n plus p to the n t times f prime of a n. Now, because my hypothesis is that f prime of um, a n is not zero. So by induct inductively, I'm making sure that f of, f of a one is f prime of a one is not zero. And I've been constructing a, a two, a three, et cetera, et cetera, so that they're always um, congruent to the previous level. So f prime of a n is not zero, and therefore you can actually solve for t. To lift the solution mod p to the n plus one, we need to solve for t. And uh, so we can we can look at this thing and see that um, you can solve for t simply because f prime of a n is not zero. Um, since, sorry, this should have been um, f prime of a n is not zero. Wow. Sorry, this is a small typo. Um, so, no, sorry, so f of a n is zero mod p to the n, but f prime of a n is not zero. So this, this is okay. Uh, you can actually solve for uh, t. <clears throat> uh, 
And so we have uh, a sequence of numbers, a n, congruent to uh, a sequence of numbers, a n, such that a n plus one is congruent to a n mod p to the n. And so this actually converges to a, a limit in the p-adic number field. So that's basically the proof of this theorem. It's a very beautiful um, theorem. Uh, and we can see that somehow all these uh, congruences mod p to the n, higher and higher powers of p to the n, uh, co uh, are uh, converging to a particular limit mod uh, in uh, QP. Uh, so from congruences to, to QP, that's basically how we're going, ordinary congruences. The main thrust of Hansel's lemma is that solving equations in uh, ZP is equal to solving equa uh, equations mod P to the N for all positive integers N. And we have these natural projections um, natural projections, z mod p to the n plus 1z, uh, reducing mod uh, p to the n. So if I have a residue class mod p to the n plus 1, I can always reduce it mod p to the n. So that's what, that's all this uh, little map is telling us. And uh, we can view zp as the inverse limit of the system. So what you, take your pick, whatever you would like to see this. Um, essentially, solving equations over the p-adic integers is tantamount to solving equations mod p to the n for every power of p, every every nth power. So the construction above the root, uh, you notice that has this inductive feature, a n plus one is equal to a n minus f of a n over f f prime of a n. Um, formally, I mean you can talk about the inverse. And this lemma bears a striking resemblance to what's called Newton's method of finding roots often taught in, in a calculus course. So let me just kind of quickly review that uh, for the benefit of the student. So Newton's method, if you have a function f of x, it's a differentiable function, you want to find a solution to f of x equals zero. Newton says, make a guess, make a guess, and take that guess and iterate a certain uh, uh, procedure and then you will see that that uh, iterative procedure converges to a zero. So this is this is Newton's idea. It's a very interesting idea. So let me try to illustrate it visually. We begin by making a guess and then iterate as follows. F of X has, if f of x has a root a alpha, we'll choose a point a sub n at random. So here's my function, and I'm trying to find um, the root alpha, but I don't know where alpha is. And so I just make a guess, pick a number a n, and uh, just make a guess. And so as you can see from here at a n, uh, the function um, has a certain value, f of a n, and but the root is over here, but my guess is over here. So uh, how do you go from the guess to the root? So Newton says the way to do that is by um, noticing that the line through the point a n, f n, having slope f prime of a n intersects the x-axis at a n plus one, and so that gives us a better approximation. So taking any particular point randomly, looking at the graph and then drawing the tangent line intersects the x-axis at a point a n plus one. And Newton says, take that one. You started off with this guess, now this is a better guess. So it's, as you can see, it's, it's closer. So um, doing that allows you to write down what a n plus one is in terms of a n. And this is uh, Newton's method of uh, iteratively showing, I mean, you can do this as a calculus exercise. The ANs then actually do converge to the root. It's a beautiful idea. And has a, and our construction with Hensel's lemma is really a piadic version of Newton's um, Newton's theorem. Okay. <clears throat> Sir? So, yes? Sir, can you explain that uh, ZP is the uh, projective limit part again? Yeah, ZP is the projective limit. Says nothing. It it's, uh, basically says that in order to solve equations in ZP, you're solving equations mod p to the n uh, for all powers of p. That's enough for now. Okay. So now let's solve x squared equals one in the real number field. Uh, this is easy. We all know how to solve this. X equals one and x equals minus one. And we can use Hensel's lemma now, because we have these solutions, we can use Hensel's lemma to lift this solution, uh, mod p to mod p squared, mod p cubed, and higher, and higher powers. Uh, now, the only problem is in using Hensel's lemma, remember the problem was the derivative evaluated at the root has to be non-zero. So 
uh, has to be non-zero mod p. So we're looking at the equation x squared minus one, the derivative of x squared minus one is two x. And when I plug in x equals one or x equals minus one, two is the same as zero mod two. Therefore, if p is not two, you can, Hensel's lemma tells us you can lift this to a solution over the p addicts. But if p equals two, there's a problem. So uh, how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, Hensel's lemma cannot be applied to study x squared equals one mod two to the n since the derivative is, is mod two is zero. But the congruence x squared equals one mod two has four solutions. You know, if you elementary number theory, I'll leave it to you to do this. If n is bigger than two, uh, it has four solutions. They are plus or minus one and, and two to the n minus one plus or minus one. And uh, you can see that these solutions now um, will have to be taken into account. <clears throat> I'm just giving you a quick proof that these are these solutions. Uh, and, and once we have them, x squared equals one mod four has exactly uh, two solutions, which then can be lifted uniquely to Q2 uh, by, by this iterative process. So this particular process uh, you can actually do. X squared equals one mod four is a little bit easier uh, to, to use to lift. So there's a little bit of a technical issue when P equals two, but it can be resolved in that case. So now let's from X squared equals one, we will now to move to X to the M equals one uh, with M dividing P minus one. Consider this polynomial, then F of X equals zero has M distinct solutions since um, integers mod P is a cyclic group. Uh, of order p minus one, so it has m solutions, and the conditions of uh, Hensel's lemma are, are verified uh, because the derivative is m times x to the m minus one, and uh, fortunately m is co-prime to p, and therefore there's no problem, so everything is fine, and we can apply Hensel's lemma, and in particular we see that for each, uh, the, the point is for each i, there's a number omega of i in zp, such that omega i is, is congruent to i mod p and omega of i to the p minus one is one. So in particular, when I take m equals p minus one itself, by Fermat's little theorem, we know that x to the p minus one minus one equals zero has p minus one solutions. Namely, they are the residue classes one, two, three, up to p minus one. So Hensel's lemma then tells us that each of those solutions has a lift and that lift is denoted as omega of i. And omega of i is called the Teichmuller representative uh, of, of i. So you now have a map <clears throat> taking x to omega of x, and it turns out to be a multiplicative character called the Teichmuller character. And if we, if for x in um, zp cross, if we define omega of x to be omega of x mod p, it's easy to see that uh, every number now uh, in ZP cross can be written uniquely as um, omega of x, namely this Teichmuller representative, and 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 times this one plus p z of p. So basically the rest of the expansion. So you 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 know that the first x is is is, the, is essentially the first uh, uh, term in the p-adic expansion of omega of x is x, and and then we're looking at the tail and we're using the diamond notation diamond x to notice, uh, to talk about the rest of it. And in the case of P equals two, you have to do this fudging with, with four. So let's not uh, worry about that too much. But now you can see that um, omega of X is a periodic limit of X to the P to the N. Because if you have A congruent to B mod P, we have A to the P to the N congruent to B to the P to the N mod P to the N plus one, easily uh, verified by induction. So that omega of X uh, equals omega of x to the p to the n uh, is equal to, uh, uh, by the notation that I had described, omega, um, let's see, omega of x uh, in this notation here, I have given well, x equals omega of x times diamond of x. So using that, you, you end up getting this particular uh, formula. And the denominator goes to one as n goes to infinity because diamond x notice is one plus p times a p-adic integer. And so when I take higher and higher powers, it goes to it goes to one. Uh, okay, I'm going to kind of skip through this very quickly. For p equals two, there's a small fudging that you have to do. 
um, to deal with the to type Miller, uh, which was established in the previous slide. So the, the unique thing is actually congruent to one mod four you have to take. Now, so we have this periodic expansion for each omega of A, uh, and we must have that uh, when you take the P minus one power, you can, uh, so omega of A starts out with A, and then you have the higher things. And I'd like to now determine what is this A1? So what is this A1? So in order to do that, I know that omega A is a P minus one through the unity in the periodic number field. We know that. So we have this equation. So when you expand, you get A to the P minus one, P minus one times A to the P minus two times this and higher powers, the higher powers can be ignored. And therefore you find that A sub one the next term in the periodic expansion of this type Miller character turns out to be a to the p minus a divided by p. Now, a to the p is congruent to a by Fermat's little theorem. So a1 is often called the Fermat quotient. So the Fermat quotient, a, a to the p minus 1 minus 1 over p, occurs in the second coefficient of the periodic expansion. So in other words, omega of a is equal to a plus a times one plus f of a times p mod p squared. Interesting uh, phenomenon. Now, there's a, another version of Hansel's lemma. It's called the polynomial version. Suppose uh, I can factor a polynomial modulo p, then Hansel's lemma says I can lift that factorization to a factorization over the p-adic integers. <clears throat> so in more precisely, if I have a polynomial f of x and factors mod p, this factorization can be lifted to a factorization over p adic integers. And I'm going to prove this. Uh, I'll just leave it as an exercise for you to do. It's it's not difficult. And we'll but we'll be using this polynomial version of Hansel's lemma to show that q p of x has irreducible polynomials of every degree, and so the algebraic closure of q p has infinite degrees. So unlike <clears throat> the real numbers and the complex numbers, uh, you have polynomials, irreducible polynomials of every degree in, in QP. <clears throat> so in order to do that, um, as, as I said in my previous um, explanation, uh, we want to produce irreducible polynomials in the p-adic number field. But if first we have to produce irreducible polynomials mod p, and then Hensel's lemma will tell us how to lift those irreducible polynomials to irreducible polynomials over qp. So the polynomial version of Hensel's lemma allows us to lift irreducible polynomials mod p to irreducible polynomials in qp. And <clears throat> so in order to count irreducible polynomials mod p, uh, irreducible polynomials are, again, um, analogous to prime numbers. And I told you in my very first lecture that um, the concept of a prime is not so simple to understand. And we have to try to look at this concept in from many, many different directions. Uh, and it's sometimes useful to see the analogy between irreducible polynomials, mod p, and uh, prime numbers. And uh, so just as we had the Riemann zeta function, uh, in the in the very first lecture, we could try to construct uh, something analogous to a uh, zeta function in the case of uh, poly irreducible polynomials. Might be every every um, polynomial can be written as a product of irreducible polynomial that comes from basic algebra. So let me just review that. If you have a field K and you look at the polynomial ring over the field K, that's a Euclidean domain, and Euclidean domains are unique factorization domains for any field K. And in particular, if fk is a finite field of p elements, fp of u is a ufd. And the quickest way of deriving the formula for the number of irreducible polynomials of degree n is to use a zeta function. So for each polynomial f, we'll define the norm of f to be simply p to the degree of f, and denote this as mod f, and then use the form of the zeta function as um, summation f monic uh, mod f to the minus s. So this is kind of like uh, developing another theory by analogy. This is an uh, important tool in research in, in uh, mathematics. Somehow you see two worlds, parallel worlds that are analogous and some, and you may try to take one idea from one world in, and try and see 
in the other world how it works. Because of unique factorization, you have an Euler product again. <clears throat> the product here now is over monic irreducible polynomials, V. And logarithmic differentiation of that polynomial. So since the number of monic polynomials of degree n is p to the n, on one hand, our zeta function has a very simple structure, namely it's 1 over 1 minus p to t. And uh, on the other hand, if we let n sub n be the number of monic irreducible polynomials, we have the identity that 1 over 1 minus p t is the product d going from 1 to infinity, 1 minus t to the d minus n sub d. And we take logarithms of both sides and compare coefficients. This gives us uh, the following beautiful theorem that p to the n is equal to summation d divides n d times n sub d. So what is n sub d? n sub d is the number of monic irreducible polynomials of degree d. So we have this remarkable equation, but we want to get our hands on n sub d itself. All we know is this relation that summation d divides n d times n sub d is equal to p to the n. Well, now we can use what's called the Mobius inversion formula. Okay, here's the proof of this fact. I'm just giving you the details here. Now we can use some Mobius inversion formula. Remember, I, last time we, we talked about the Mobius function in the Art and Hasse exponential. Uh, the Mobius function is defined as mu of 1 equals 1 and mu of n equals minus 1 to the k if n has k distinct prime factors, and otherwise it's just 0. And the unique property of the Mobius function is summation d divides n mu d is 1 if n equals 1 and 0 otherwise. And using this, it's not hard to prove uh, what's called the Mobius inversion formula. So anytime I have some g of n equal to summation d divides n f of d, I can invert. I can invert it. <clears throat> f of n equals summation d divides n mu d g of n over d. So it's a beautiful idea uh, with very profound consequences. And you can also go backwards. So we'll use the Mobius inversion formula to derive Sir, an expected. Uh, don't we need some assumption on f that it is multiplicative here? No, 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 no. That no, is no. not required. No, no, no. Multiplicativity is not required. No, 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 no. Yeah. This is for any 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 function, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll use the Mobius inversion formula to derive. I think f of 1 has got to be non-zero. That's about the only condition you need. Otherwise, everything is fine. We'll use the Mobius inversion formula to derive an explicit formula for the number of monic irreducible polynomials. So in the previous slide, we had um, the uh, result. So we can now uh, invert that formula and you get this formula first, uh, apparently discovered by Gauss and Dedekind independently. N sub n, the number of monic irreducible polynomials of degree n is one over n, d divides n, mu d, p of the n over d. And uh, why Mobius inversion? Now we make an important remark here regarding the existence of finite fields or of order of order p to n for every value of n. If f of u is irreducible of degree n, we know from uh, basic algebra that uh, the polynomial ring divided uh, by the ideal generated by f of u is a finite field of size p to the n. And so the formula uh, shows that uh, n sub n is at least one for every n. See from here, this is the formula for the number of monic irreducible polynomials of degree n. The question is, how do I know this is always bigger than or equal to 1? Well, this is where p-adic um, perspective comes in handy. See, this number, summation d divides n mu d p the n over d, can be viewed as a difference of two numbers. The Mobius function takes on only three values, plus 1, minus 1, or 0. Forget the 0. It doesn't make any difference here. Uh, but certainly the plus one and the minus one do matter. And uh, if you look at D equals one, mu of one is one. So the highest power of P that appears there is P to the N. So I can look at the summation D divides N as mu D P to the N over D as a difference of two numbers, A minus B, written in base P, with A having um, N plus one D digits and B having fewer. So B has fewer digits. So if I take a number with more digits and subtract a number with fewer digits, I get a number which is positive. Therefore, N sub N is positive and it's a polynomial count. It has to be at least one. So this is the fastest way I know of proving that there's always an irreducible polynomial of degree N mod P. It's the fastest way I know. Hmm? 
uh, if you look at a standard algebra course, uh, if you look at algebra, let's say Lang's book on algebra, he gives a much more complicated proof of this fact. So now uh, you can use the polynomial version of Hensel's lemma and deduce that any irreducible polynomial mod P can be lifted to an irreducible polynomial in QP of X. And from this, we did use that the algebraic closure of QP is of infinite degree over QP. Now we'll give a brief description of how to extend p-adic norms to finite extensions of QP. So don't worry too much about the technical details. If you don't know algebraic number theory, uh, that's fine. But if you do know uh, algebraic number theory, you'll be able to under quickly understand what's what's going on here. It's not essential for what I'm going to uh, rest of the course, but it might be a good idea to fill in these details. So if I have an algebraic number field and P is a prime ideal, it's clear how can we can define the field of p-adic integers, again, using the same norm business, clear because you have unique factorization into prime ideals. You can take any number X, you can look at the ideal generated by X and factor it uniquely and then define your p-adic norm in the same way. So take the X, take the ideal generated by X, it divided by a power of the prime ideal P to some power of VP of X and times something else which has nothing to do with P and then you can define um, the uh, norm in this fashion. By the way, as, as uh, I think Anurada asked earlier, uh, why do you, you can normalize it with different constants, but this is preferred because of funct what, what would be called functoriality. So now that I'm moving norms across fields, I, I want some sort of compatibility. And so this is the logical choice for that. So norm P is the norm of the ideal P. VP of X is the power of P appearing in the factorization of the principal ideal X. The field obtained by completing K with respect to this norm is called K sub P. And uh, there are other ways other ways to metrize this uh, field. But uh, for the time for the time being, this, this is a functorial, uh, functorially neat way of doing it. And so for if P, if pi is an element of P, but not of P squared, we'll define the norm of pi to be P to the minus one over E, where P is a rational prime below P, and P is uh, equal to pi to the E times U, where U has nothing to do with P. Then um, we obtain an equivalent metric uh, to, to the earlier thing. So this is how, at least uh, if you don't know algebraic number theory, rest assured that there's a consistent way of extending the p-adic norm from QP to extensions of, of QP. And in the case of this generalized uh, 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 situation, you can have, again, the ring of p-adic integers, where p now is a prime ideal. Uh, and if p is a rational prime below this prime ideal uh, script p, we can view kp as an extension of QP. And we can show that every finite extension of QP is actually obtained in this way and for such extension, the residue field is a finite field. And then again, functoriality forces us to define the p-adic norm in the, using this norm. So this way we can take, uh, the, it's, it's the way I defined it in the earlier thing allows us to say, we have this interesting theorem. The p-adic norm of alpha is I can take my alpha, I can take the norm down to QP and I get a number now in QP and I've already defined the p-adic norm there. And then I just take um, one over the uh, field extension. And this is the consistent way of de defining it so that er uh, everything is compatible. And this turns out to be a p-adic norm. So this is uh, perfectly fine. And then in, the con in this context, there's a, an idea, a concept of ramification. So let me just make a few remarks about ramification. Uh, first, it's a field of degree n, so you can look at the field capital K as a vector space over QP of dimension n, and so it's isomorphic to QP to the n. It's evident that Q K is complete with respect to the ext extended norm, and every time you have an automorphism, it's also consistent with the automorphisms as well, uh, and uh, if we define for x in K, x non-zero, that the, P add, the VP of x as before, the map uh, turns out to be a homomorphism into the additive group of rational numbers, and the image turns out to be uh, of the form one over e times z. So this is, uh, e is a divisor of the extension of the degree, and this e is, is called the ramification index of k over qp. Uh, and we see that it usually, usually e equals one, 
And in that case, we say it's unramified, but it's ramified if E is bigger than one, and it's totally ramified if E equals N. So it can be, it, it can, it will always be a divisor of N. <clears throat> so it'll be a finite number between one and N. <clears throat> So an element in, in pi k, such that the VP of pi is one over E, where E is the ramification index, is often called a uniformizer element, term that will be used uh, later on <clears throat> in, this, in these lectures. And then the ring of uh, piadic integers now plays, uh, you know, the, those elements of norm less than or equal to one plays the role of piadic integers. <clears throat> okay. And the maximal ideal is, of course, the elements with norm strictly less than one. So, um, so we have a few, let's say, a few exercises and examples so that we can illustrate what we've been talking about. <clears throat> uh, let's consider the Pete cyclotomic polynomial. The Pete cyclotomic polynomial is irreducible over QP of X um, because uh, you can try to show, firstly, that it's irreducible over uh, mod P. And I'm going to leave this as exercises. Um, so if you have some familiarity with um, the Pete cyclotomic polynomial over Q, you shouldn't have too much problem to show exercise one. Now, if you have a Pete root of primitive Pete root of unity, you can see that uh, you can look at the extension generated by the Pete root of unity. Then this uh, first exercise tells you that because the polynomial is irreducible, the degree of the extension must be P minus one. And then if you have um, zeta m as a primitive root of unity, I'll leave it this as a third exercise that you can show that m is equal to the product of one minus zeta j as j goes from one to m minus one. And with these exercises, we can deduce that the norm of one minus zeta p is p. That just comes from what are the conjugates of one minus zeta p? Well, they'll just be one minus zeta p to the j, where j goes from j is one from one to p minus one. And then this particular tell, um, equation, equation tells us that the norm is P. And therefore, because the piadic value of all of them is the same, <clears throat> you can see that the piadic valuation of zeta P minus one is P to the minus one over P minus one. We met this before. This was the radius of convergence of the exponential um, uh, series. <clears throat> so K is totally ramified. And the number of pi equals one minus zeta p turns out to be um, a uniformizer element. So it's a uniformizer. Okay. Uh, now let's apply Strassmann's theorem. Remember Strassmann's theorem from last time? It was about bounding the number of zeros of a power series. Uh, we can extend, firstly, this theorem. We discussed it last time only in the context of QP, but now I would like to discuss it in the context of. Uh, extensions of QP. Uh, we can consider both the exponential and log functions in this setting as well. And applying Strassmann's theorem shows that if we apply it to this particular power series, so pi was a uniformizing element, it was sitting inside an extension of the field, and we can consider this power series, and this power series converges uh, piadically. And this uh, has at most P zeros because we look at the uh, piadic valuation, and we find out where does it hit its peak. Uh, it hits at its peak uh, at, at, at P, therefore we, it has at most P zeros by Strassmann's theorem. But then we know that one zeta P, zeta P squared, zeta P minus one are all roots of this thing. Therefore, we have found them all. Those, are, those must be the, 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 the uh, numbers. So this result has now some curious consequences about the power of P that divides the rational number. So I take my uniformizing element and I look at this pi, pi squared over two up to pi to the n over n. And then I take the norm down from um, of this thing to Q. I get an ordinary rational number and I want to know what's the power of P that divides it. Well, um, you can actually find that it has to, it has to tend to uh, infinity as n tends to zero because that thing is uh, going to zero. So this is the analog, the number field version of that theorem that I mentioned last time about two plus two squared over two plus two cubed over three dot 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 to the n over n having a very high power of two dividing uh, the numerator. Okay, <clears throat> that's a curious example of what we just finished discussing. 
Now, the other point that I need to make today is that the algebraic closure of QP is not complete. So on one hand, we, we realize that the algebraic closure of QP has infinite degree of over QP. And then now we've extended the norm to this algebraic closure. And then we would like to know, um, does every Cauchy sequence have a limit and is it complete? And uh, the answer is it's no. Um, so QP bar is not complete. And the way you prove this is uh, by doing the following construction. For each n co-prime to p, let f of n be a primitive nth root of unity. And if uh, p divides n, let f of n be 1. And consider this uh, convergent uh, series, f of n, p of the n. If uh, qp bar were complete, the series would have to converge to some element alpha in qp bar. Thus, alpha would be uh, lying in some finite extension, k, let's say. And observe that f of 1 is 1, because 1 is co-prime to uh, that a 1. Uh, one, doesn't, uh, one, 1 is not divisible by p. Suppose we've shown that f of n is, is in k for all n less than m. We'll show by induction that f of m is also in k. If m is divisible by p, there's nothing to prove, because if it's divisible by p, f of the value of f is 1. So we may suppose that p is co-prime to n, but by the induction hypothesis, the number alpha minus the partial sum uh, lies in, in k, and therefore uh, beta, which is the tail now, it's the kind of like the f of m plus p, f of m plus one dot dot dot, uh, this thing is now, um, uh, sorry, this, this, uh, so observe this formula for beta. And now um, we go to this field and let P be a maximal ideal in that thing. And beta then turns out to be, uh, as a p-adic number, beta is congruent to F of M. See, that's from, from the previous slide. Beta is congruent to F of M modulo P. Modulo this ideal P. Now, uh, on the other hand, the equation X to the M equals one has a solution mod P because F of M is a primitive M fruit of unity. And by Hensel's demo, we can lift this solution to k. Since m is p's co-prime to m, all the mth roots of unity are distinct. Uh, that was exercise three in the previous slide. And it follows that f of m also lies in k. So this proves that all these coefficients lie in k. So all the roots of unity of order prime to p lie in k. And since the roots of unity of order prime to p are all distinct, we get infinitely many residue classes mod p which is a contradiction since k over qp is a finite extension. So this is basically the proof that qp bar is not complete. So we complete qp bar and, and uh, call it c sub p uh, with respect to this thing. And now for alpha in qp bar, we will then define um, the p-adic norm to be, take the norm down to qp and fudge it with this um, power. This is checked that it's well defined. And it turns out that CP is algebraically closed with respect, and QP bar is now dense. <clears throat> so you keep on uh, taking the algebraic closure of CP, and now it turns out that CP is uh, finally complete. So in order to establish this uh, fact, we'll need um, something called Krasner's lemma, which basically says if I have a number in CP and it's close to beta in CP, uh, and uh, it's algebraic over QP of beta, then alpha must lie in um, QP adjoint beta. So that's basically a technical lemma. Um, and uh, you use this technical lemma to show that CP is now finally algebraically closed. So here's the formal statement of Krasner's lemma. Let K be a complete field with a non Archimedean norm. That's a p-adic norm. Um, let's take alpha and beta in K bar with alpha separable. Uh, then suppose all the conjugates uh, of um, beta are, are not uh, of alpha are alpha i, then um, and suppose that beta minus alpha, the p-adic distance is strictly less than the distance between alpha and its conjugates. Then it turns out that the field generated by alpha must sit, sit inside the field generated by beta. So let's just let's just park this lemma. It's a technical lemma. Uh, and we'll, we're just going to use it to show that CP is now algebraic closed. So suppose you have um, a number in CP. Um, alpha is a number. And supposing it's algebraic, 
uh, f of x determinable polynomial in CP of x. Since QP bar is dense in CP in, in our, by our previous slide, we may choose a monic polynomial g of x whose coefficients are sufficiently close to those of f of x. So since QP bar is dense, I have a polynomial, the minimal polynomial of alpha, and I'm trying to find um, um, I'm trying to find a polynomial with with ordinary coefficient, ordinary integer, uh, periodic integer coefficients. So I can choose a polynomial g of x whose coefficients are sufficiently close to those of f of x, and then g of alpha, which is g of alpha minus f of alpha, because f of alpha remember is zero, uh, is very small in terms of the periodic norm. And writing beta equal to beta 1 with beta 1 sufficiently close to alpha, you can write g of x as a product of x minus beta j's. And then you see that beta, beta is very close to alpha periodically. It's less than these, um, fat, uh, these quantities, and it just fits nicely into Krasner's lemma. And so immediately you deduce that the field generated by alpha is, must be contained in the field generated by beta. And that allows us to say that alpha um, is uh, in CP. So basically, what what are, we, what are we saying here? We're saying that uh, CP is algebraically closed. Okay, now let's uh, look at uh, the exponential function. Many of our previous discussions about convergence of series and power series extends to CP as well. So all I'm doing in this lecture is trying to extend some of the discussions that we did last time, the periodic exponential function we discussed last time as summation next to the end of our factorial, but we discussed it only over the periodic numbers. Now I'd like to discuss it over this field of C, C sub t. So this converges, we already agreed in this small circle. And then the periodic logarithm is defined in the usual, the usual power series. And this also converges in the domain mod x less than one. And these two functions are inverses of each other in the smaller domain, because they only make, this, this is a smaller domain than, than this. Therefore, um, you have to be a little careful and the proof is not difficult, but a bit long, and I'm not going to put it down here. Um, interested readers can consult my book or Gouvet's book on uh, periodic numbers. So let's just uh, know that these functions are inverses of each other, and they make sense also for C sub p. Now, um, Eva Sala was the first, um, at least in print, to extend the logarithm to not all non-zero periodic uh, complex numbers. Um, so his theorem is there's a unique extension of the periodic logarithm, such that log of x, y equals log x plus log y, and log of p is zero. Now, it's interesting that uh, the first hints of um, a periodic logarithm probably appear in Kummer's work. Uh, and then later, they appear in Ankeny, Artin, and Chawla's works. Uh, and then neither of those, especially the Ankeny Art and Chawla paper, uh, was not um, well developed. Uh, the periodic uh, logarithm makes an appearance there, but it was Eva Sabo who, who realized that how important it was and uh, began proving this theorem. So we'll show that every element x can be first written as um, p to the r times the root of unity times uh, u. Uh, U is in CP and, and satisfies this inequality. So these are, these are basically, um, so you first come up with a factorization theorem for every X in CP, some power of P, some root of unity, and some number U, which is very close to one. And if you know, if you have that, then you can see that because it's, it's in, lying in the disk less than one, the log of that thing can be defined. So, um, we can extend the norm of QP bar in the usual way. QP bar is dense in CP. And uh, therefore, we can begin by taking, uh, if R is equal to the power of P that divides X, um, then let P to the R denote any root of X to the B minus P to the A equals zero. So every root of this equation is some power of P. This R need not be, it could be a rational, it's a rational number, right? So, <laughs> And we can um, take this x1, it's going, it's going to have norm 1, and we can find y1 in QP such that uh, y1 is very uh, close to x1. Then um, by the um, Hensel's lemma construction, we look at uh, this y1, and uh, omega y1 is the lift of y1, and we will set u to be y1 over omega y1, and therefore any element can be written as this p to the r w times a unit. Uh, this is unique up to p power roots of unity. 
And then having this unique factorization uh, representation for elements of CP cross, we can now define the logarithm by setting log of x to be simply summation n equals one to infinity minus one to the n plus one over n um, u minus one to the n. So this is uh, basically how we define the logarithm on all of CP. Now, of course, there are things to check, but I'm not uh, going to do that. Uh, this gives you just a construction on how to look at the logarithm in this p-adic uh, CP. And it turns out it's well-defined. Okay, so what can we do with this p-adic logarithm? We can apply it to study Fermat quotients. Uh, with this extended logarithm, we observe some interesting connection to Fermat quotients. And I'm going to use capital log to talk about the Iwasawa logarithm. Uh, and then omit the p if it's clear that the prime is meant. And sometimes we write little log uh, also. Um, no confusion will be caused by such a uh, sloppiness. So notice that p squared divides log a if and only if the Fermat quotient satisfies f of a equals zero mod p. That goes back to our earlier calculation. And so if you look at our earlier calculation, log of a, and because the log function satisfies log x, y equals log x plus log y, you can now see that log a is equal to one over p minus one log a to the p minus one. This number by Fermat's little theorem is equal to one plus p times f of a, the Fermat quotient. And then we use our log expansion and see that it's p f of a over p minus one. So this is a nice uh, understanding. What's the derivative of the p adic logarithm? In the classical real analysis case, the derivative of log x is uh, one over x. So in the p adic uh, logarithm case, uh, it has nice properties in the usual logarithm. Firstly, it's locally analytic everywhere. Um, in the sense that every every what does locally analytic mean? Every time you have a point, there's a small neighborhood uh, in which you can uh, give a convergent power series expansion in that in that neighborhood. That's what local analytics, analyticity means. And in that in that little neighborhood, you can differentiate term by term. So we find that um, it can, because it's locally analytic, it turns out that uh, d log x actually equals one over x. And uh, I'll, I'll leave that for you to check. Uh, let's look at the derivative of a to the x and try to compute the derivative of a to the x. We need to, what, is it, what does it mean? You need to, uh, at, if you want to remember, I told you last time that if I want to compute the derivative of something, I take f of x plus something that goes to zero. Well, what goes to zero? Powers of p go to zero, right? So you can replace x by powers of p and then uh, calculate this limit. So this is what limit we have to calculate. And as before, we noted that log a is log a to the p minus one divided by p minus one. It suffices to compute the limits for numbers a congruent to one mod p. And so when you write a as one plus tp, you find by the binomial theorem, one plus tp to the power p to the n, it can be expanded using the binomial theorem. And then um, you can knock off po higher powers and then confine your attention to uh, the sum up to p to the n. And it then becomes clear that a to the p to the n minus one divided by p to the n is, uh, turns out to be log log of a, because that turns out to be the, exp the, the expansion. So k minus one factorial cancels with the k factorial, giving the one over k at the bottom. And that's just the uh, t to the k over k, which was the expansion for the logarithm. As I told you, this uh, these these calculations were done by Eva Sala, but um, earlier versions of this appear in works of Ankeny, Artman, and Chala. So the derivative of a to the x at x equals zero is log a. So you can have this kind of fun with piadic numbers. Once you know these ideas, you can ask yourself, take the classical results that you learned in first year calculus and ask yourself, what are the versions of these? These examples all illustrate the use of Hensel's lemma in extending our understanding of periodic calculus. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm sorry I went a little fast because I thought we lost some time, but um, I think uh, enough for the day, uh, certainly on this rocky Bandhan uh, day, I think it's a cause for celebration. Thank you very much. Mm, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ram Murthy. For the participants, if you have any questions, please. Uh,
Uh, yesterday's uh, lemma where you exchanged, uh, we had uniform sort of uniform continuity in A, M, N, and uh, then yeah. we exchanged those limits. Can yeah. that be thought of as some analog of Fubini's theorem? Or I am yeah. I have not yeah. understand. Students. No, no, no. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. You're absolutely there... right. Yeah, Fubini's theorem is, of course, often uh, stated in terms of integrals, uh, but uh, double series is often a special case with a discrete measure. Uh, so certainly uh, when you're trying to interchange double series, uh, usually usually if they're non-negative coefficients, you can do that. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Okay, yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah, mm. somebody else has a question. Yeah, there is one question from Deepa. Uh, hello, Deepa. No, I don't see. Yes, my question is... Make, make unmute to her. Deepa, madam. Deepa. Garge, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, please make the unmute to Deepa ma'am so that she can uh, talk. She can, Deepa, Deepa can unmute herself. Yeah. I think Deepa, Obviously. if you want to ask a question, you can just unmute yourself now and ask. Okay, so my question is uh, like on this last part, uh, he talked about uh, uh, par paradigm logarithm, and like I, I got a little bit confused because we are we are if you're in the field of number theory and we are talking about uh, paradigm integers and paradigm numbers, does it make sense to define uh, paradigm? logarithm since they, they they usually works for like when you have reals and then taking derivatives and there is there is, a, there is there is there is a place where I wrote like p square divides uh, log of like something so I was does it even make sense to to define uh, divisibility for for log of a paradigm number like or like does the log of a paradigm number also an integer or it's it's something rational or real number something like that yeah. So, 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 so the way we have been defining whether it's the exponential function or the periodic logarithm is via power series. So, remember in my earlier lecture, I talked about functions defined by power series, and uh, we know um, functions defined by power series have a certain radius of convergence, and this applies in any kind of metric metrizable field. And so, in in the case of the um, the um, particular um, logarithm function. So log of one minus, minus of log of one minus X is uh, summation X to the N over N. And uh, that's a series which converges in modulus of X less than one. And uh, so you begin uh, the definition. That's a well-defined series in that, in that particular um, domain. And then uh, Iwasawa's brilliant idea was that uh, this actually can be extended to the entire periodic complex domain simply because he came up with this uh, unique factorization theorem that you can write uh, any periodic uh, complex number as uh, power of P times a root of unity times some number U, which <clears throat> is going to be uh, sitting inside, it's going to be very close to one, uh, and it's going to be sitting inside uh, this uh, disk. So as U is going to be very close to one, means U minus one is strictly in less than one in absolute value. And then you would then say log, so you want to now define log of X, and uh, log of X, remember we've, we've made this constraint that log of P is going to be zero anyway, and log of any root of unity is going to be zero. So log of x, intuitively speaking, would be then log of u, but u is very close to 1. Therefore, you would write u as 1 plus u minus 1. And now u minus 1 is very close to 1. So log of u is actually log of 1 plus u minus 1. 
And then now you can use the power series to define log. So basically it's like, it's very much like the, uh, if you were at my lecture, maybe yesterday, uh, talking about gamma function, uh, if you, or, you know, gamma function originally defined for real part as bigger than zero, uh, Euler. And then you extend it to the, to it, the complex. Exactly, terms. exactly. Yeah. So you kind of move it to the place where it is well-defined and that's what, what Iwasawa was doing. So this is the kind of, it, it is very counterintuitive. I think uh, Shripad asked uh, a couple of days ago, uh, how do you visualize CP? And uh, the answer is, well, I, I don't think anyone visualizes it. It's just an abstraction, but it's uh, because we can't visualize it doesn't mean it doesn't exist there. Uh, and it's certainly very much um, a, an important realm of, to explore. So I hope this has answered your question. So we're moving it, moving into this world, which invisible world, uh, very formally to power series. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I think I, I have a little bit of. Okay. okay. Yes, Good. Thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, any other uh, questions from the participants? Uh, sir, uh, in the uh, yesterday's lecture, you know, you wrote below that Kummer congruences that uh, notice what this theorem says uh, using a uh, p-adic metric. What did you mm -hmm. mean by that? Well, that'll become apparent maybe in the later lectures, but essentially what's going on is every time k and k prime are <coughs> congruent, congruent mod 5p to the e, bk over k and bk prime over k prime are congruent mod p to the e. That's what was going on. So in other, in other words, whenever k and k prime are very close, periodically, bk over k and bk prime over k prime are close periodically. So, which signals that maybe uh, this is some sort of continuous function. BK over K must be some sort of uniformly continuous function. And in fact, it is. That's That would be the extension of what's called the piadic Riemann zeta function. <clears throat> I'm not, I, I, I will mention that later, but that's what basically what I was hinting at. Sir, is it B, BM over BN uh, is congruent to BN over N mod P or P to the E, sir? Uh, P to because, the E. Uh, BK, BK P... over K. BK over K is congruent to BK prime over K prime mod P to the E. There is this extra factor also, sir, 1 minus P to the K. Yeah. Yeah. That's just uh, what is called the P Euler factor has been removed. So basically what's going on is we're looking at a function um, which interpolates the Riemann zeta function. Remember I told you bk over k is essentially zeta one minus k. And when you think of this one minus p to the k, you're removing the p Euler factor. So somehow you're trying to get an, another understanding of the uh, of the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, the classical one. And somehow this extra factor has to be removed before these congruences show up. So it's not quite the case that bk over k is congruent to bk prime over k prime. That's not true. You have to fudge it with that. Okay, and that, fudge, and, that, and that fudging is going to be important in what's called the p-adic interpolation of the Riemann zeta function. Okay, fine. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, I don't think now there are any questions from the participants. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Anuradha, madam, you like to make uh, final comments? Yeah, I would like to thank sir for uh, enlightening us further on this topic. I do hope uh, after some more study, we will be able to ask more questions. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the link okay. remains the same for uh, the lectures from for tomorrow and day after. Okay. Now okay. this is now this is fixed. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thanks, Claude. Yeah, I hope it will be uh, hard to get thank in you, again man. tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> take it easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Bye. Yeah.